Serious lawyers, what's a case you regretted winning? Story one. I'm a work comp attorney. Now represent injured people, but used to work on other side insurance defense. There was an applicant with a serious injury. Fell off a ladder, busted back with fusion, shoulder messed up, years of treatment. Internal issues, psych issues, really just messed up up. 50% plus permanent disability. We were five years in and finally getting to settlement time. If we bought out his future medical, settlement pretty far into six figures. This guy was the sole provider for wife and two kids. Then we found out he had aggressive brain cancer. Expected only a couple years to live at best. Thus, we wouldn't buy out future medical anymore. Still got permanent disability for $1.60K-ish. But can't give medical buyout based on 25-plus year life expectancy anymore. I felt terrible for the guy and his family. Me and the adjuster tried to get insurance to agree to some sort of amount like five-year buyout, but the bean counter said hell no. The attorney knew it wasn't me making the decision. Even though he worked on that guy's file for five-plus years, he decided to take zero dollars in fees. I have so much respect for that attorney turning down dollar ten k plus in fees to help his client in a very poor situation. Story two. I do family law and I represented a father who had lost most of his custody from candy use and imprisonment as a result. He came to me saying he was clean and doing good and had his life together and it checked out. He had been clean for almost nine months, not counting jail time, and seemed sincere in wanting to resume a full relationship with his son. The other side fought viciously to keep him at extremely little custody and supervised at that, but we prevailed and got an order restoring fairly frequent unsupervised partial custody. Not long afterwards, only about three months after the case, he was back doing candy, sold most of his furniture, and for me the most soul-crushing is that he set up a fake GoFundMe stuff for his child's cancer. His child didn't have cancer and has never had cancer, so you know where that money was going. I withdrew my appearance at this point, so I don't know what happened afterwards, but I imagine and hope his custody was taken away. Basically, the net result of winning that case was that the poor boy had to witness his father relapse on candy and was exploited for money. Worst case I ever won. Story three. I work in medical malpractice defense. Once I had an obstetrician gynecologist who burned a patient during a procedure. When I met with the doctor, he lied to me throughout the representation over 16 months saying he had no idea how it happened. There is a doctrine in law called res ipsa, meaning absent some sort of negligence. This accident could not have occurred. Woman came in without a burn, and after the procedure, the woman left with a burn. There's no way this doctor didn't know what had happened. The area of the burn was where he was operating on. It wasn't until I brought up settlement, because this was not a case we could win, did he say, oh, maybe I do know what happened. We ultimately settled that case which is considered a favorable outcome, considering the potential high monetary verdict. Sometimes I think this doctor really ought to have lost that case and their license. Story 4. I wouldn't say I regret this so much as to this day it amazes me. As a first-year associate, I was given a terrible PI case where my client received a flu shot and thereafter felt pain in his shoulder. He went to another doctor who performed an MRI and determined he had a torn rotator cuff, which was undoubtedly not related. My job was to allege the flu shot caused the rotator cuff tear. Our ortho actually correlated the two, which is the more regrettable position, and the case paid out. Being the bottom of the totem pole, I had no choice but to take the case, which was handed down by a partner. But at the same time, just overwhelmingly made me feel like the worst stereotyped attorney and just hated having to walk into court on it and feel my reputation being destroyed. Story 5. I do juvenile work, criminal law, and family law. I represented this client first, when he was a juvenile charged with disorderly conduct at school and fighting. Then when he became an adult, it for was for simple things like possession of marijuana. As he got older, it became easier and easier to figure out what part of his life hasn't gone as well as it could, and I tried to counsel him and push him to better himself. He got his GED, he started going to NA, he started classes at a community college, and found a part-time job. On the night of his 21st birthday, he was charged with a DWI. Of course, I'll take care of that, too. About six months later, we are due in court for trial on a Monday, and he doesn't show up, which at this point in his life is highly unusual. As I'm trying to figure out where he is, the court starts going over arraignments, first appearances, and then, lo and behold, three people are up for murder charges. The prosecution starts to tell the judge what the facts or circumstances of the case are and mentions a few victims' names. 
Apparently, my client was at a party when these three individuals decided to allegedly do a drive-by shooting. My client suffered multiple gunshot wounds and didn't make it to the hospital. So, by default, as you can't prosecute a dead person, the state has to take a dismissal. I guess technically a win. Either way, it was crushing to me as I thought he had really turned his life around. He had edit. Wow, this really blew up. Thanks for all the positive comments and the bling. Also, since some people asked for clarification or were confused, one, I truly believe he was on the right path forward. Two, GED equal sign high school equivalency diploma. Three, NA equal sign narcotics anonymous. Four, DWI equal sign driving while impaired. Story six, in one of my first cases after passing the bar exam, a young man retained me on a drunk driving charge. No one was hurt, but he totaled his car. During trial, the arresting police officer testified that my client was clearly drunk at the accident scene, and that my client was loudly blaming the accident on the flipping unpleasant person who stole his car, crashed it, and then fled before the cops arrived. However, according to two other witness statements tendered into evidence, it was my client's friend, the passenger, who was screaming about the unpleasant person who stole the car, not my client the driver. The cop must have confused the two men during his testimony. This discrepancy raised a reasonable doubt in the judge's mind, so she acquitted my client. At the time, the acquittal was somewhat unexpected for me. In my personal view, my client was clearly drunk and responsible for the accident, regardless of who was blaming the mystery, unpleasant person to the cops. But I was happy my young client got off. No one was hurt and lessons were learned. And I was quite euphoric to have won my first criminal case. The regret? About a month after the acquittal, my young client called me at 3 a.m. from the police station saying, It's me again. The police arrested me for drunk driving again. Can you help me? Not only did I answer no, I instantly regretted getting the earlier acquittal. My client apparently didn't learn any lessons. Story 7. Had this happened to me twice. Got my client out on bail only to thereafter have him up and terminated. First time he was in building supposedly selling, got chased by the police and a struggle ensued where he was shot point blank in the head. Mother told me that it was my fault that he was terminated and that I was working with the DA and the police. Second time, a young man no more than 16 gets released while waiting trial on robbery. One of the conditions of release was that he maintain a curfew. That very night, he breaks curfew, goes over to somebody else's house, and was terminated in a candy-related robbery. Mother blamed me and said that the devil was working through me that we were all demons. Criminal defense is a hard business. Edit. Thank you, everyone, for the kind comments. Rest assured, I don't take what they said personally. I've been around a long time and know that they were just acting out and that I just happened to be the closest person at the time and the only one who would actually listen to them. Edit 2. LOL. Yeah, I can see how that reads like I might be talking about my mom. Going to leave it because of the LOL. But for the record, my mom thinks I'm a saint and can do no wrong. Edit 3. To the people saying that got what they deserved. Honestly, it's easy to throw stones, but sweets, alcohol, mental illness are tough things. GD willing none of you will know what it's like. Edit 4. To those saying criminal lawyer bad, etc. It would be easy if the world was just, and the government never overreached. Who are going to go to when it's your turn to be ground under the wheel? Story 8. Did a divorce where the husband, who I was representing, wanted to trade custody of his children for a set of bedroom furniture. The bedroom furniture was not even like a family heirloom. It was furniture that you could probably get at a rooms to go or something. Ugh, still makes me ill. That's why I got out of family law. Edit. I'd honestly like to thank all of you for your various points of view on this particular pain point in my career. For the record, yes, I did win that particular point, but it did not fill me with any joy. But those who said that it was probably for the best, perhaps you're right. Story 9. I won a summary judgment motion that my firm filed not expecting to win. We had a decent argument, but odds were way worse than a coin flip, and judges don't like granting summary judgment because it's an extreme remedy. Client initially was thrilled. Case is over. We tried to break the news gently. Nope. Three years later, we're back in the same spot we were before we won our motion. The other side appealed it up to the state Supreme Court and won because the Supreme Court said the trial judge should have denied our motion. So we are back at square one, north of dollar one hundred k in legal bills with no resolution. Maybe it'll settle, maybe it will go to trial. I'll find out in the next three, four months. ETA. Clarified my parenthetical. Story 10. The one I particular hated happened at my first law job. 
This woman was a long-term client of my boss. In the past ten years or so, she has been caught driving under the influence eight times, violated home incarceration countless times, been caught with controlled substances a few times, and stabbed two people on home incarceration. My boss at the time was the master of getting people off for DUIs, so she had only been convicted of a DUI third and always managed to stay on home incarceration with whatever releases she desired. I always regretted her cases because that woman is truly a danger to the public. She's undoubtedly going to terminate someone someday. But I'll be damned if she isn't the luckiest woman alive in getting away with DUIs. Story 11. Little late to the party, but I've got one I still think about a lot. Worked in criminal defense, represented a guy in a DUI. He had priors, so another conviction meant time, loss of license, problems. Long story short, he was pulled over by police after they followed him leaving a bar. At trial, I elicited admissions from the arresting officer that during the 2.5 miles he followed him for, he did not observe a single moving violation. No speeding, erratic driving, driving over the lines, blowing stop signs, running red lights. Didn't even stop suddenly at red lights. Also got the DRE officer to testify that the accused only spoke Spanish and they couldn't get an interpreter officer to the roadside to explain the field sobriety exercises, which the officers documented the accused refused to perform. Jury came back in 15 minutes. Guy was extremely grateful and his lovely family was very gracious in thanking me in our office. Feel good about the whole thing. Couple months later, I'm in county to meet with a client and I see him in one of the pods. Find out sometime after the trial he violently sexually assaulted his eight-year-old stepdaughter? Think about that one a lot. Edit, the comments have helped. Thanks. Story 12. There was a case that I saw that involved a claim with fee shifting, meaning that if the plaintiff won, their attorney's fees would get paid by the defendant. Defendant pushed an aggressive legal position at trial that the judge agreed with and won, avoiding a few thousand in liability to the plaintiff and a few thousand in attorneys' fees. So far, so good. But then the plaintiff appeals all the way to the state's high court, requiring a ton of briefing and time. High court agrees with plaintiff, reverses, and sends back to the trial court, which now enters judgment against the defendant for a few thousand in damages against the plaintiff and tens and tens of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees from the appeal. The defense lawyer probably regretted winning at first on that aggressive argument to the trial court. Story 13. This probably won't be the best answer, but it is a real one. After law school, I had to turn down a criminal defense job offer because my wife got a better offer somewhere else. So basically, I followed her along and was desperate to find something. After three months of fruitless efforts, I would take just about any job that required a JD, whereas literally the only thing I ever wanted to do was criminal defense. Three months after moving, I got an interview for a real estate litigation job. They hired me the next day, looking back, that was probably red flag number one. First day on the job, they taught me how to foreclose on a claim of line. These are two things I had never heard of before. Turns out, it is totally brainless work if you have the right forms. Mind-numbingly boring, basically just cutting and pasting new addresses and amounts owed. So anyways, it took me about two months to realize this, when I had my first set of hearings. But literally, my sole purpose at the firm which represented over 100 homeowners associations, was to take people's houses away for not paying their homeowners association dues. After my first set of foreclosures, I actually slipped into a pretty legitimate depression. I was getting paid peanuts to drive nearly an hour to work every day to do work I despised on behalf of people I literally could not pretend to care about. The straw on the camel's back was when I started signing the foreclosures and realized I was that guy, you know? I understand someone has to do the work, I guess. There certainly is a lot of money to be made, but it was not for me. I did that job for three months, came home one Friday, and told my wife I'd rather be homeless than go back on Monday. By some stroke of luck, I started a stellar criminal defense job within two weeks, and all of the heartache has 100% been worth it. I've won a lot of cases. You have to redefine winning and losing when doing criminal defense because sometimes even a particularly juicy plea is a win i -mo and never once felt bad about it. For example, I got a guy's plea deal cut from 60 years to 15 years for a string of robberies where the interrogations and confessions were overwhelmingly unconstitutional, like the interrogations were textbook how not to do an interrogation, Missouri v. Seibert, and stuff like that. 
Never lost sleep over someone not going to jail. So yeah, every case where I took someone's house away, probably two dozen times, for not paying HOA fees, generally $4,000 or less, was the worst case I ever won. Fudge Hoas. Story 14. A few pop to mind. The one where the client never paid said above is absolutely right. Poured a ton of effort and emotion into a case and got a great result, only to get stiffed. No, it's cool, I made sure they didn't foreclose on the family farm, but just ignore my bills. We settled a case while the jury was out. We were the defendant, so we were potentially on the hook for some amount of money if the jury found us liable. While they were deliberating, we agreed to pay something. The jury came back, found us not liable at all. So we won and still had to pay the agreed to amount. And appeals that I've won. I've gotten very good results on appeal. Sometimes the remedy is that you go back to the trial court and do it all over again. Reverse and remand. Surprise! The trial court judge who made boneheaded mistake that got reversed is not happy to see me. Story 15. Late post, so this will probably get buried. This is another family law story using a throwaway because some of my colleagues use Reddit. Summer of 2018. I get work regarding what seemed, from the client's description, a pretty drawn-out and messy divorce case. The husband was my client, and he made it seem very adamantly that his soon-to-be ex-wife was after his every penny. Given he seemed to have a fairly high-paying job, it seemed like a pretty common type of case. The city I work in has many instances of this. It has a high cost of living and a lot of well-paid working professionals in private industry. He was a very well-spoken, amicable guy in his late fifties and truly seemed like he'd been taken by surprise and betrayed by his soon-to-be ex-wife. When I actually got to the case, however, I was basically floored. His wife was a working professional as well, worked in government, they'd been married for over 20 years and had two kids together, and a paid-off house. Before taxes, he made almost three times what she did, not counting his stock options, and yet she'd contributed equally to their mortgage on every home they'd owned over the course of the marriage. By all accounts, despite a vast difference in income, she'd carried her weight, raised two kids, and worked full-time during the entirety of the marriage. I live and work in Canada. She could have asterisk easily asterisk raked him over the coals in the divorce if it had gone to court. Instead, it seemed like she'd done everything she possibly could to not have him subjected to that. This divorce had been ongoing for five years before he hired me, and it was basically him looking a gift horse in the mouth over and over, a constant renegotiation on the contract they'd both signed initially, with him skimping on alimony and then debating on lesser terms. He was basically given an inch and tried to take a mile, dragging it out for so long that per divorce law it asterisk had asterisk to go to court. I almost suspect he did so as a way to try and drag her through the mud, though he may have genuinely been that delusional. I consider it a win only because his ex-wife was adamant about only wanting what was somewhat fair, and for it to be over because of the strain it was having on the family. Per the contract he owed her still, about 50k in back pay, but she was content with 15k, which was less than this guy made in a month. I did regret the win, though. She seemed like a very nice woman with the patience of a saint, while almost all of his anger towards her seemed to come from wounded ego. Edit. I should also note that though they had two kids together, both were in their twenties by the time I was hired, and custody had never been an issue at all, even for the one who had been a minor when they'd separated. Story 16. The one where the client never paid. Eat edit, clarification, explanation. When I was a young associate, I was assigned to do a civil commercial trial for a client that was not happy with the senior partner. He stopped paying. We moved to withdraw. The court refused to allow us to withdraw and forced us to go to trial. Spend a significant amount of time in trial prep, etc. I win the trial. Client never pays. Client's position was that my boss screwed up the deal and that there never should have been a dispute trial to begin with. Firm policy prohibits us from suing clients because that causes a drastic increase in malpractice premiums nine times out of ten. If you sue a client for non-payment, they will countersue for malpractice. Story 17. I handle employment cases. We took a disability accommodation case against a regional retail company. To be clear, we were right. Our client was not being given a pretty easy accommodation. Normally, demand letters don't have any real effect. We have stopped sending them to streamline the process and have just started filing with the EEOC or the courts directly. That's SOP for us. In this case, we followed SOP and filed with the EEOC. The company got in touch with us immediately, expressing horror and regret. 
The whole thing was one poorly trained manager acting out. While that's common, companies usually try to cover for the manager and often make things worse. This one did not. They immediately sent him to be retrained, offered the exact accommodation requested, and paid all lost wages and fees, with some extra for emotional distress. Client happily accepted and went back to work. After seeing the company's great response, I felt bad for taking them to the EEOC. Not bad enough to start sending time, wasting demand letters again. But if I ever see them on the other side, I'll make an exception. Edit. I almost wish there was no confidentiality provision in the settlement agreement. Would love to say who this was and tell people that they're a great company. I now prefer shopping with them over their competitors, since I know they're an upstanding group. Every company fudge up sometimes. Not many acknowledge it and try to make it right when they do. Story 18. I did some custody work early in my career and won some cases more on the merit of my trial skills than on the merit of the parents. The thing with family law work in general is that there is essentially no bar to entry. Anybody with a law degree and a pulse can get a family law practice up and running quickly because there is just an absolute glut of work. What that also means is that 75% plus of the lawyers practicing family law are clueless and awful. Early in my career, I certainly was clueless, but at the least I was not awful. Therefore, in a battle between clueless plus awful versus just clueless, clueless usually won. So yeah, I can't recall any specific cases except to say that fighting over children in court is a terrible thing and basically everyone loses. I regret that entire portion of my career. Story 19. Not really winning, but I recently had a case settle where my client was so obviously lying it was painful. He was in a fender bender and said he was too disabled to drive or to work at the office as a result, and that his employer fired him after he had been on disability leave for almost a year. A few months after filing, we discovered that he played in a national, amateur, full-contact football league, and there was footage of him getting tackled, end zone dancing, and tackling during the time he claimed he was too hurt to sit at a desk. Even when I confronted him on it, he claimed he hadn't played while he was injured. Despite having a stat line and footage of him playing from games dated on days he was supposedly getting physical therapy. We didn't settle for as much as most of my cases, but he still walked away with like $1.20K. I'm happy to be a plaintiff's attorney for the most part because my clients have typically been wronged, but he was such a bald-faced liar it really pissed me off. Edit. It's worth noting that, embarrassingly opposing counsel, brought it to our attention after they spoke to some of his former co-workers who recalled him bragging about being in the league. Story 20. I helped represent a slumlord in a lawsuit regarding discrimination in public housing based on disability. The state was representing the disabled tenant. The facts were pretty clear. Slumlord discriminated on the basis of disability. Our state doesn't have much case law regarding discrimination in housing based on disability. So the state was really hoping to get make case law. We ended up sowing enough doubt to survive the tenant's motion for summary judgment. Knowing that the tenant needed money, we made an offer for a decent amount of money for a disabled tenant, but peanuts for the slumlord. I imagine the state wanted to proceed to trial, but the tenant needed money and accepted. By gaining the best outcome for our client, we allowed the slumlord to get off basically scot-free and deprived our state of needed case law. Story 21. My first case as a lawyer was a probate case. Husband and wife each had three adult children from prior marriages. Husband terminated wife and then terminated himself. I represented the husband's estate. The kids all hated each other. Wife's kids obviously blamed the husband for terminating their mom and the husband's kids blamed the wife for making him crazy enough to terminate himself. The husband had multiple properties and was a prominent attorney before the murder. We had multiple walkthroughs of the property with both sets of kids and lawyers and needed sheriffs there each time because the kids were threatening to terminate each other constantly. Case lasted three years, nobody won. Story 22. Prosecuted a murder case? 21-year-old kid starts dating an older guy's ex-girlfriend. The older guy, real roughneck, loose connections with a local biker gang, was going all over his small town talking about how he was going to kick the kid's peach. The older guy sends some of the ex while he's getting drunk at a bar, so the kid says something smart peach in response. Older guy comes to the kid's house to fight him. The kid shoots him once and the older guy passes away. Jury didn't buy self-defense or castle doctrine. Convicted of voluntary manslaughter. 20 years. Burned up his appeals with no luck. I have a son about the kid's age. I could totally imagine him doing the exact same things if he were in a similar situation. Cow's going to haunt me until I pass away. No doubt about it. 
started thinking about other work the moment the verdict came back. Story 23. Divorce case represented wife who was pissed because husband left her for another, younger, thinner woman. Wife reported that their young daughter made a comment about something that could be interpreted as molestation by her father. That is, the husband. The only conceivable corroboration about the comment would have come from the daughter's testimony. But the daughter was so young that her credibility would be suspect, and nobody wanted to put her through the ordeal of testifying against her father. There was no possibility of criminal prosecution of the father because there was no other evidence of molestation. But the wife pushed for sole custody and a requirement that the father would only get supervised visitation for the next year or so. We she won. I'll never know for sure what happened between the father and daughter. But the more I think about in retrospect, the more I doubt that justice was served. Story 24 was representing the government at a social benefits tribunal. The applicant was an autistic man who was struggling to make ends meet but was trying his absolute best to contribute everything he could to society. He had a job where his manager was very accommodating and he was a very sympathetic person. He just wanted the extra cash to make his life a little easier for himself. Sadly, he didn't qualify for the benefit, but I think he deserved it. My closing argument was that no matter how much we empathized with this man, no matter how deserving we thought he was, he simply didn't qualify and the tribunal had to apply the law. He was unsuccessful and when I left the building to head back to my office, he was just sitting outside on the curb crying. That image has stuck with me for a few years. Pretty heartbreaking. Edit. For those of you that are sending me words of support, thank you. That was the lowest point in my career and I have moved on. It's really important to remember that mental health in the legal profession is a very real issue that is terminating people. There aren't sufficient supports in place to help people like me and many others who find themselves in positions like this. For those telling me I'm a horrible person, you literally can't say anything that will make me feel worse about this, so please have some compassion. I work elsewhere and provide a much-needed service to my country and my community. I also donate to a mental health charity on a monthly basis. What are you doing to fight unfair systems? Also, in case you aren't aware, social benefits are a finite resource. Often, the criteria for qualification are strict. Not everyone can receive it, otherwise there wouldn't be enough to go around. The particular system I was working in was a needs-based system. Those with the most severe disabilities met the criteria, and I often advocated on their behalf, despite the government's initial position if I felt they met the criteria. Story 25. Guy was a convicted felon so couldn't be in possession of any firearms. He pawned two guns that were traced back to him by the pawn shop paperwork. He said they were his and put his thumbprint on the papers. Also had store clerk say he walked in carrying them. His story was that his girlfriend's mom found them after her father passed away. They were his and wanted to get rid of them. So girlfriend, also convicted felon, asked him to help sell them, which he did. DA office refused to waive the three-year M.N. Man prison sentence, so it went to trial. I was the prosecutor when it went and ultimately got a guilty. The guy had to do three years day for day. I felt bad because I think his story was true, but he had a conviction for armed robbery and close relationship battery from 30 years ago, so that was why the office wouldn't agree to reduce the sentence. Story 26. In the spring of 2018, I was a third-year practicing intern at a public defender's office. As the job entailed, I dealt with a lot of clients who were facing time, but none really blew my mind than the following. Sometime in that spring, I got up every morning as usual, drove to the office, located in a building with the courthouse, and picked up the files for the, for the supervising attorney. I did this because I liked having the exposure with other attorneys, whether prosecutors or defense counsel. On this day, a file was scheduled for a probation violation hearing. I looked over the file, and the client had three years of probation. I found this very odd due to the initial charge, possession. Regardless, I thought another one, because, as awful as it may sound, it really was another one. It wasn't the first PV and wouldn't be the last. Even so, I go to the docket call, case is called, I say, attorney, we move on. In the same room, our POs, their office located floors above the PDs. I go into the holding cell to talk to the client. I ask out, and a white male, 30, 35, comes up. I introduce myself, tell him what and who I am, etc. The first words out of his mouth were $600. I didn't know what that meant or what was going on. So I asked him to find out. What I quickly learned was that this client was intellectually impaired. He spoke as if he struggled to form sentences that one may consider coherent and intelligent. 
During our conversation, he kept bringing up the fact that he didn't do anything and that he is paying, paying every month, etc. And probably due to my lack of experience, I kept trying to steer him towards the issue. Why did he violate his probation conditions? It didn't even cross my mind that, hold on, maybe he did not actually do it. I left the cell and talked with the public defender, told him the situation. Sometime later, after handling a few other cases, as you who do it on a daily basis know, we went to talk to him again. This time I just watched and listened. Immediately upon introducing himself, $600. I done paid it, can't shake those words off. Throughout the discussion, the money was being brought up over and over, so I decided to figure out what he meant. I went to the clerks, asked for his information. Now I understood. He had fees of over $2,000, and all he had left to pay was $600. As probably all of you know, you don't pay, you are in violation. Back in the slammer. So in his mind, he thought he was there because he wasn't deemed to have paid. The reality was much worse and different. After a mini-investigation, I determined the halfway house, or similar to the idea, he resided. I contacted the wonderful old woman who ran it, if you will. She gave me details that this man, although he knew, could not regurgitate and express. Turns out his P.O. was a scumbag. He had gone to the halfway house, told our client what a piece of cow he was and how he was a waste of DNA. He proceeded to go into the kitchen, sat down, and brought out his service firearm. Then he ordered our client to go into the backyard. Our client did. P.O. told him to dig a grave for himself and told him to use the P.O.'s gun to shoot himself in the head. All of this done in front of the old lady. On the day of the case, I called, and she immediately came to testify for him. The judge dismissed the case. Found out later the P.O. was sexually assaulting others and was let go. Never had the chance to meet him face to face. Edit. Don't regret winning the case, but certainly regret having the train of thoughts I did before I even knew the situation. Edit. Sorry for the confusion regarding P.O. He was let go from his position, and last I heard from a fellow P.O., he was facing legal recourse. Story 27. Third-year law student in a clinic. I came into law school with a very clear moral compass. I knew what I wanted to do, criminal defense, and I had very strong feelings about the death penalty. I thought there was never a situation that warranted it. Cut to me working in my school's death penalty clinic. The way the clink worked was that you'd typically be assigned one, two clients, review their case, visit them, and do research at the discretion of the supervising attorneys. I had one client, and his case will haunt me for the rest of my life. Goes in for life after a really brutal assault on a teenager during a burglary. Proceeds to move to more and more secure facilities after numerous guard stabbings and an escape attempt. But that wasn't what got him the death penalty. See, while my guy was in Supermax, he managed to slip his cuffs, beat a guard to death with a metal bar, and throw his batter corpse down the stairs. All of this is on video. There's no question he did it. So the jury deliberates for like a day before they give him the long goodbye. By the time I get the case, it's about reviewing his eligibility for the death penalty. So I dig into his case file for the testimony that appeared at trial, and there's all this stuff about huge problems with his cognitive ability and like his actual brain structure. So with the supervising lawyers okay, I do a little independent research, consolidate all the different testimony and map it onto a brain. The conclusion I come to is pretty simple. This mother father has less than half a brain. Through a combination of candy use, abuse, and birth defects, roughly half of my client's brain just is not present anymore in any meaningful way. Including all the centers that regulate hormone production, fight or flight response, and threat assessment. I find a bunch of medical reports where people with just some of these conditions get severe behavior imbalances, and in at least one case, psychotic episodes. Basically, I help establish that this guy has the kind of diminished capacity that makes him ineligible for the death penalty under Atkins. If he's successful on an Atkins claim, then he is structurally ineligible for the death penalty. But do I feel good about helping to probably save this guy's life? Fudge no. Because it means he's going to be in a supermax forever, and he's already shown that he can terminate people in a supermax. If he doesn't get the death penalty, he'll still be in prison for life and I can almost guarantee that he will injure or terminate another guard during that time, probably multiple ones. But if he's put to death, we're executing someone who really isn't meaningfully responsible for their crimes because most of their brain is gone. He never had the option to make the right decision, or make any decision, because of his incredibly extensive brain damage. It's out of my hands now, but they are appealing so it's going to go before the court eventually. I drank a lot that semester, and I'll never do death penalty work again. Story 28. 
My mom is a lawyer who worked a case against one of those if you or a loved one were affected by a candy suits. The candy was, in some cases, causing heart issues. Important to note, stress can cause heart issues as well. The suit was filed by a slimy law firm who were telling people that they could win money, even if people were not actually experiencing the side effects. One of these clients had a brain tumor, recently had a nasty divorce, and her son had just passed away, among all sorts of other terrible luck. Her heart issues did not match the side effects of the candy and instead looked stress-related. So my mom had to cross-examine this woman, asking, Could your inoperable brain tumor be causing you stress? Could your divorce from your abusive husband be causing you stress? Could the death of your young son be causing you stress? That woman's case was dismissed, but my mom felt terrible. Story 29. I was a collections attorney, a gut-punching job. Even though people owned the debt, I'll never forget the sound of a mom on the phone asking why her bank account was levied with the sound of unruly and crying children in the background. Filed a motion for summary judgment against defendants one and two. Defendant two appears and says she didn't live at the service address. She lived at Y address. The judge says you need to reserve. Motion denied as to defendant two. Granted as to defendant one. Defendant one was there but didn't stand up and speak for some reason. After the hearing, Defendant 2 says, Defendant 1 lived there too. I wasn't her attorney, so I couldn't tell her that she should file a motion for reconsideration. We started garnishing Defendant 1's wages six weeks later and were still garnishing months later when I left. Story 30. I worked in criminal law my first summer of law school. My first case was defending a large 6'2 teenage gang member who stabbed a rival gang member in the temple with a pencil with deadly results. I was put in charge of the motion drafting and research under a supervising attorney. I also had several conversations with this young man, but he was remarkably well-spoken, so I never felt like he was an actual killer, even though he admittedly was one. I remember working really hard in the library for hours looking for helpful case law. It felt great in the moment to help your client in any way possible and put up the best defense. Ultimately, they conditionally discharged him, which is family court, since he was a juvenile parlance for one year probation. I remember my emotions immediately shifting from relief to guilt, fear. I questioned the entire practice area that could allow a killer to walk the streets because of good legal work, and I ultimately decided it was not for me. No judgment to any criminal attorneys, just not for me. Now I'm a happyish real estate attorney, and by happyish, I mean terminate me now. Story 31. Yeah, a nasty case. Had a guy in the UK who came from Zimbabwe who lived here for three years from the age of 16 and then served in the British Army. Got back, got himself a girlfriend. One night went to her apartment without her there and found items that would suggest she had more than one partner. After having a heated argument with her, it turns out she is a close relationship worker. He gets annoyed and strangles and terminates her. He runs off to Heathrow Airport to catch the first plane to Zimbabwe and is caught by the police. He claimed that he had his passport on him because pure chance, and the reason why he was going back to Zimbabwe was so he could commit at his grandfather's grave in shame. The cases against him were to A, imprison him, B, deport him. He got imprisoned, but we were called in for the second case as I was with an immigration law firm then. We won the appeal twice, on the grounds that he was intellectually scarred by the fighting in the army. His officer gave him an amazing report and that British soldiers don't get the best treatment in Zimbabwean prisons. Now he walks the streets with a tag as a result of good behavior. This has always been a weird case. He was definitely supposed to have been deported for the grievous crime. But human rights are human rights. Story 32. Represented someone in the sale of a bar. Buyers of the bar were only buying the business. Most of their free cash was set as a signing payment to the seller, so seller got the cash whether or not the liquor authority approved their license. They allowed the seller to secure the sales contract and the rental agreement for the bar location with a lion on their license, and buyers pre-signed an agreement to surrender the license back to seller if they fell behind on payments. Inventory was sold separately. We got buyers to accept tax liability, if any, for the preceding business. We also told them the seller had only paid themselves in dividends and never cut a paycheck to themselves. Buyers were clueless enough to breathe a sigh of relief at this. Made buyers acknowledge they received the sales agreement 10 days before closing and that we were advising they consult an attorney and an accountant in that time. They didn't. One of the most one-sided business deals I've seen. Buyers came back two months later and I thought, here we go. Nope. They had a disagreement with some investors and wanted me to represent them. Sorry, conflicted out. Business, of course, failed on down the road and the license went back to the seller. Story 33. No one will read this, 
but it's my favorite case of my relatives, who is a lawyer. When he was a young personal injury lawyer and had to take all the cases assigned to him, he had a client who was drinking with his neighbors on someone's front porch. It was a spontaneous get-together, and he got quite drunk. Starts talking about his amazing new portable saw he just bought. He brings it out to demonstrate, propping up a board against the porch stair and his thigh. He proceeds to cut his banana so badly it was hanging on by a thread. So my relative has this guy in to talk to, and he says he wants to sue the whole world. The maker of the saw the store that sold it, and the neighbor whose porch he was on. He unexpectedly drops his pants right then and there to show the damage. He refused to accept any blame for it. At the trial, my relative's pants zipper broke, and he had to borrow the judge's stapler to staple it. Kind of ironic, and I always thought lawyers had boring jobs. Story 34. As a former employment lawyer, I regret defending a company in a lawsuit in which the employee had an accident and lost her left leg, had the left side of her body covered in burn scars because of the company's fault. The case was more or less like this. This lady worked at a toll on a highway. Whenever she needed to go to the toilet, she'd have to close the toll, change the sign lights to red so no one would go through that toll. Unfortunately, due to lack of maintenance, the lights did not change, and when the lady was crossing the road, a car ran her over, dragged her ten meters. After defending this case, I realized I did not want that in my life. I wasn't meant to be a lawyer, so I dropped everything and quit the week after. Story 35. I used to represent veterans to get their service-connected disability benefits. I represented a homeless veteran who told me that he was in a certain war zone. Everything he said corroborated with the timeline and how events played out and story barely changed. So I took him at face value and argued for service connection for his PTSD with the earliest effective date possible due to a technicality and expedited hearing due to his homeless status. Got him six figures and off the streets for a while. Then his full records finally came in two years after I requested them. He never served there. He never served overseas at all. Kind of burned out after that. Story 36. I'm a legal secretary, and I can tell you about a case I regretted being involved in. We represented a woman who lost two children in an accident. On its face, that sounds terrible, and she seemed like a deserving and grieving parent. However, without telling too much detail, both children lived with her ex, including one who wasn't even his biological child because she wasn't a suitable parent. I recall her one time telling us she was in the witness protection program, so she may have been delusional or intellectually ill as well. I really don't recall. That was when I realized she might not have been mother of the year. The children were in a vehicle with their father, her ex, when it was slammed into and they were in the back and terminated. Her ex was distraught over the loss of his children and she wanted dollar dollar. One day her ex showed up at our office very distraught and wanted to show us photos of his children and how much he loved them. It was a horrible accident. He lost his children too, but his ex wanted his insurance policy. I remember complaining to my boss about it, and his response was, do your job. I always hated work on that case. Ultimately, we probably did get her the insurance money for the loss of children who didn't even live with her. I honestly don't remember since it was over 20 years ago now. But it left me feeling kind of crummy knowing it was about dollar dollar and not justice. Story 37. I'm an in-house attorney for a company a close friend owns. This is a case we settled which was a win in our book, but not in the strictest sense. Though these cases are rarely that straightforward. The allegations centered around securities fraud, so I engaged outside counsel in securities transactions and baptized myself in the statutes. Said friend is a terrific human, though she dropped the proverbial ball in filing certain securities registrations due to being distracted. Her husband was dying of cancer at that time. He eventually passed away. However, she is an absolute control bad person with an ego the size of a fresco and refused to delegate. This is why she's in trouble. Basically, business negligence that led to a securities violation that looked like fraud. Now, you don't have to be malicious to be convicted of fraud. But if the State Securities Commission finds you liable, they can post for the public certain journalistic articles expounding upon their latest conquests, or at least... They can in this state. My friend was featured in particularly gruesome articles that slammed her reputation in the ground. She was devastated and became unstable to the sky, etc. I settled with the commission and won many concessions, including a waiver for the hefty fine and dismissal of huge violations for the company. However, she was required to personally accept the fraud allegation and is barred from certain securities activities for 10 years. Practically, this means that her job prospects and making a living will be severely limited, not just due to her destroyed reputation. 
She is deeply depressed because of it, even though we won on other points. I've never seen someone descend into mental and emotional despair and hopelessness as quickly as she did. It's a sad, horrible, and debilitating process to watch. Story 38. Got late to the party, but this story still makes me sad and angry. Not me, but my ex-boss, Civil Matters. The firm represented a large construction company here in my country. They built and sold 30 houses, in Spanish, en un fraccionamiento. There is a lot of corruption going on here in Mexico, and in this case, the company paid off a large amount to not follow construction regulations and save some money. Turns out, some years, I believe it was two years, after all the houses were sold, there was a massive water malfunction which led to flooding, and 85% of the houses collapsed or were inhabitable, the construction company being at fault. The people obviously sued for the prices of their homes and damages of furniture, etc., but they could no longer because the legal figure they could use, wrongful construction, had already prescribed, passed the time to legally make a claim. My ex-boss is a very gentle soul and a great guy. He always remembers that case as the worst one and says everyone to reject similar ones because the guilt is way too consuming. People lost their houses, their furniture, their electronics, and most had mortgage or similar debts in order to pay for them. Breaks my heart.